well, let's let's try the first one. I just pushed that. Was that was that audible all over the room in the back? Like, you turn turn the lights on, right? Uh, would you put the did this one on? Uh, I don't know. I don't know whether they twigged it. Isn't doesn't the word twigging mean to pull one's ear? Uh, twig. Twig. It's an English slang. Why don't you pull, pull the chair what, what, Was that one audible all over the room? By the way, the people in the back hear that. Uh, could we talk about that one a little bit in terms of uh, response? Yeah. I don't know. Well, why did I? The only I, I did it because I, I've seen Tony do it. Very good reason. Uh, he did it. I, I think the reason is concentration. Maybe the, the, this room doesn't get get dark enough. But if you push one sense down, the others go up. That's true of all the senses. So if you lower the lights, you hear better. You heard the phrase "mist on the moors tonight." There's not very much to see, but all the other senses sharpen. So it's very involving and mysterious. Sorry, not funny. Yeah. But what he uh, he he did this one last week. He he also he went around the corner and got a uh, a Chinese gentleman to put on a countdown in Chinese as well as the the one in, in English and Russian. And uh, the reason for that he turns down the lights is, is this, as Dr. McLuhan indicated, that if, if you render the other, if, if you downtone the other senses, you expand the influence of the one sense of hearing. Now, he said he noticed uh, that as soon as the thing was about halfway through, the one with the Chinese countdown on it, where they all get into harmony and are counting down at the end of it, uh, he noticed that halfway through this last presentation he did, that about 30% of the people in the room were lighting up cigarettes. Uh, just automatic, almost all at the same time. When it started to get to them, they, they did something like that. Now, interestingly, and I don't know whether this is the room, that number of times that, that I've seen this played for their various kinds of audiences, uh, much more, a, a stronger impact, really, just on the level of sound, and I've seen with some films that have very striking visual savagery with them. I, I don't know. Is there any comment on this sort of thing, that what you might do, the kind of feelings you can engender just through the ear? And the, and the interval, which is very tactile. But the space between sounds is not audible, naturally. It's tactile. You have to close that kinetically. Uh, let me play. Is this ready to go just by pushing the button, button here? Uh, these, these are a number of selections of things that Tony has done, most of them involving uh, the human voice. Let's see. Boys. Now, just uh, descriptively before we uh, talk about that, that's uh, from like uh, two weeks old until 14 years old. Uh, something that could not have been done, of course, until our own century. And until the, the advent of audio tape, uh, when did audio tape, Marshall, Ted? 48. 48. Before 1948, the only way that something like this would have been possible would have been with optical film and the cost would have been 20, over $20,000. So just in terms of the kind of thing that the media, this, this Tony says in terms of, of actual stuff used, tape and things like that is about $2 worth. Uh, it, we call it time-lapse Nancy. And time-lapse Nancy's mother says, yeah, you should hear her now. She's at City College and she's talking about pot all the time, you know. <laughs> but uh, that, that's, that's an incredible piece of sound. Now one, you think, do you think it's a good uh, phrase, time capsule? Is that a time capsule? Yeah. 90 seconds of a 
13 years of life in 90 seconds. Uh, in uh, the case of Time Magazine, their time capsule experiment flopped because they left the ads out. Would you explain what the time capsule was? Time capsule was to pack, uh, package uh, uh, a year of time in a, a single little sort of package uh, that you can turn through in just a minute or two. And uh, the, the thing in compressing the issues, they left out the ads, and the public was just not interested. The, uh, let's see, and also, and this, this is a very interesting way in which sound can be used. Tony, with his own uh, children now, has, he, he lives in the most uh, plugged in and taping house in the world. I mean, there's more outlets and things like that. But he puts, he puts his tape recorder on uh, in his child's bedroom, for instance. Uh, and with his young daughter, Michaela, who's now four, he has tapes of her going way back. And uh, he noticed, and I, did I tell the story before, how a certain time every morning uh, she, she'd stop her crying or gagaing in, in the crib. And uh, as Tony played these sounds back, he found out later at the age of two and a half, whenever she started talking, she was always stopping at the same time saying, what's that? And then he started, and, and it was the garbage truck. Then Tony started playing back to when she was a year old, when she was six months old, when she was three months old. And every morning when the garbage truck came along, she would stop her crying in some kind of an attempt to respond to or to figure out what was happening. It's an incredible way to sort of, you know, climb inside the psychology of a child at that age by, by the use of another medium. Lots of uh, grievance, uh, grievances aired apropos garbage. But uh, had you heard the Polish one? What happens in Poland when they stop paying for the garbage? They stop delivering it. <laughs> we, we won't start Polish jokes this morning. <laughs> I'm 0 for 1 on the only one I tried this year. Uh, let, let me see what the, what the next one is here. I'm not sure whether it's... Uh... I'm Bosco for Johnny's Milk. Oh. It's delicious because... Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's got this, this awful trouble with the agencies. The first one there is the old heated up announcer telling you it's delicious. And, and a lot of times he'll hand in something like that. They'll say, now who is the script writer for this? We have to fill in the contract. Or he's got another one where he's got these kids, uh, they're trying out a new kind of candy. And they just, you know, it's like putting one Milky Way in and trying to talk over a Milky Way now. And you are sure, it's a pretty good candy. I try a kind. And then he gets all the way to the end. He plays a minute of this for the guy at the agency, and the guy says, no good. The kid never said it was chewy, you know, and all you hear. Just, just thought of a good ad for these candy bars. Try sending one to the cleaners in your white Palm Beach for an unforgettable image. <laughs> How about the Charlie Chaplin? Uh, about Tony and Charlie no. Chaplin? Oh, you tell him. No, no. Oh, no, I... I, I you <laughs> we, uh... We, we had an incredible experience. Tony, uh, at the time, he's, he's recorded most of the great folk singers of our age. We got a, a, a Pete Seeger one here coming up a little later. But uh, because he was very interested in the fact that a lot of artists and people never had, when, when their records, when they weren't uh, sort of commercially viable, uh, they never had a chance to hear themselves sing or perform. So he's had a long stream of, you know, kind of great artists coming to his studio and because he's interested in exploring sound. Uh, Charlie Chaplin came one time in the 30s, uh, and Tony was playing around with the tape, and he played it. He was rewinding, and he was playing it backwards and getting all this yellow, 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 yellow kind of stuff that comes when you play the tape. Charlie said, do that again. Tony did it again. Charlie Chaplin mimicked the backward tape, Tony played his mimicked tape frontwards, and it made words. He said it the most, uncan well, I shouldn't say uncanny ears, but most incredible performance that he had ever seen. He doesn't, he doesn't think he knows anybody else in the world that it could ever do a thing like that. Uh, and, and Marshall, when he heard the story, suggested uh, also that, that he had actually made a lot of his movies working on this same principle, working backwards rather than working forwards. Maybe that's not understood, but he, he would 
act a scene from the script backwards, and they'd photograph it forward, and then project it, and it came out right. There, there, was, there were a series of visual tests. Sorry, uh, should I throw you the microphone on the... All right. Uh, there is a series of visual tests on which actions can you perceive as being backwards and frontward actions. In other words, if you, if you photographed a number of things and decided to either to play them backwards or forwards, which ones are discernibly backwards and forwards and which ones could be gone either way and you wouldn't know the difference? Uh, I think maybe we, we could borrow them and show them. George Stevens, for instance, uh, the film director, when he did Shane, found out that he could get it an enormous effect, the, the gunman in there, Wilson, who was played by Jack Palance, had this, this enormously serpentine way about him. And, and the way that Stevens uh, achieved it uh, was by photographing him in reverse, taking the action of him uh, climbing slowly from a horse and then reversing it to make it the action that he was getting on the horse, and he was able to achieve something he couldn't have done just by doing it straight. Um, let, let's see if they... People here have any observations on the problem of instant replays in sports. What has it done to sports? The instant playback, a play is made, stopped, and then played back for the audience a few seconds after the play has occurred. What happens to the whole nature of sport under these conditions? To hear that, he said, it enables the game to partake of the character of a book, store, a store of information so that you can have access to it after the event. Anybody have experience with uh, home videotape recorders? Any, anybody here in the, your neighborhood got a home videotape recorder? What, what they found, very interesting, as I think of it, you think of home videotape recorder. It's a machine, $1,500, I think, they're available for now. Sony has one or Norelco has one. And if you go out, you can put the timer on. And uh, if you miss a program, you're going to be out. You uh, just push the button, and, and when you come home, the program will be on tape. And you can replay it at your own convenience. Now, what, what they found, I talked to the, the president of, of Fairchild uh, Camera, who was interested, who has a model, and was very interested, and they put it out for experimentation in a 1,000 families. And what they found out was that this idea of taping stuff off television is almost a minimal consideration, that once the people have the videotape recorder in the house for six months, they almost never use it to tape stuff off television so almost all of the use they do for it is, to, is for home movie type things. They, they, the, the magic of performing in front of a, an inexpensive three or four hundred dollar television camera and then seeing yourself coming out of your own television set is so overpowering that, uh, that they, all the other storage retrieval uses just never get uh, considered at all. Now that, that's a, it's, it's a fascinating kind of thing. But the technology is there. In fact, uh, this other print technology, maybe. A... Well, print technology enables you to retract your mental processes. But in this human interest level of the videotaper, you see, when you <clears throat> close the taxi door when the handle's in your pocket, you can play that back too and see why you ever got caught that way. But uh, I thought I thought you'd find that amusing. Simply, have you ever tried uh, closing a cab door when the, the handle was in your pocket? I uh, don't recommend it. <clears throat> uh, let me see what the next. Um... You can do it. Come on. Every all day long. Things to make you feel a little. I was in Chicago for the first time. Uh, I just want to explain what happened here. Uh, Tony does a program on WNYC radio once a week and on, on various kinds of themes. Uh, this woman here was a, a Negro from the South that Tony was interviewing, and she went through this 
in the real indignity here that she shared with him. Uh, and Tony asked a question in between, which you don't hear. He said, well, that was really pretty awful. He said, then he asked, he said, what was the nicest thing that ever happened to you to remind you of who you were? And this is her response to his question. Been out of the South. She was she in Chicago. Up on the and a white lady touched me on the shoulder. And said, uh, that, that's maybe my favorite line of all time. What was the nicest thing to ever happen to you? And this lady said, Excuse me, ma'am, but your slip is showing. Wow. You can't write that in the attic when you're trying to do the great American novel. Um, he I would walk a mile to uh, make peace. Uh, how can I speed it up that way? Uh, no. 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 Uh, I want to pass on through a couple here. and. Okay. That's good. Did I, did I write about it? Oh. This, uh, this one I, we can't share with you completely, but uh, he has a text that uh, he hands out of different people saying things. He said, well, what kind of person would say a thing like this? And he's got one where uh, the text says, uh, I, I do commercials because, uh, not just because of the money, so I like money, but, but in general, I, I don't mind doing the commercials, certain excitement to them. And then, then you play the tape and, and you find out who the person is who talks like that. Ooh, I'm all, forget it. Yeah. The sound of typography and lettering oh, and their effect on reading and writing work. It's something to think about. Uh, do you want to comment on this uh, speed reading thing at all? Or? Yeah, well, let's, uh, there's some, a couple of interesting uh, points come out of here. The, well, the whole the sound of sense, as, as Frost calls it. Uh, this same fellow, Bob uh, Marcato, who does a lot of the commercials, who wanted to garble a line in there, had a beautiful demonstration down at, at Tony's one night with, with Tony's dog. Uh, he called the dog over and said, come here, you miserable, little, hateful bitch. And, and he, he spoke in this very gentle kind of way with, with the vocabulary. Then, then he, and the dog came over, uh, wagging tail and all that sort of thing. Then he says, I love you, you dog. You're just the most beautiful. And the dog was cowering in the corner and everything like that. But uh, this, this whole question, uh, Eric McLuhan is a speed reader in the Evelyn Woods uh, uh, school and things like that. But there are this, this thing on the kids learning how to read here at the age of three and all the music being taken out of the process and then being leveled off to the marching to the beat of the typewriter, the brown cow walked, wow, you know, uh, you want to go out and, and fight some of those machines there, at least I do after a while. Um, it, should we play this next uh, selection here before commenting? This is a, uh, we got about uh, 10 minutes and this is a, about a four minute one. All right. Th this. Uh, this is a, a, I think Pete Seeger wrote, wrote this, uh, the song, uh, Who Killed Davy Moore? Is that a Seeger song? Dil Dylan wrote it. Uh, and Seeger sings it, is that it? So Seeger had a recording of it. Now, what Tony did was to take the original recording, which we will not hear here, and, and it's a straight, strong, ballad, Seeger style thing. And he took his tape recorder back into the prize fighting world environment described by the song, and added actual sounds from the prize fighting world from an actual fight to the Davy Moore song. You've got a, you've got a reading session coming up, and uh, we thought we'd mention a couple of books that would um, be useful to look at purposes of this course, we'll get a 
bibliographical lists with comments shortly, but there are some readily available items, and I don't hesitate to mention a little known one, again, <clears throat> came out of that enterprise, Professor Carpenter and my own, on explorations. And this is explorations number eight. Professor Carpenter printed explorations number nine under the heading es Eskimo. It's an unavailable, out of print book, but will be back in print in due time. Uh, this is entirely devoted to the eye ear world, its comparison and contrast. And it is the print and issue was designed by Harley Parker and done on a unique process of photo printing. It's not set up in type at all. The typography is projected through celluloid and is not set up in the ordinary print sense at all. It enables you to put letters over letters or anything over anything in transparent, transparency style. But the whole book, this entire issue is done that way and has some interest. It's just been printed uh, a few weeks ago by the Something Else Press here in New York. It's the whimsical title of the press. It's down in the village something else. The editor is Dick Higgins. It hasn't uh, really been out a couple of weeks. And um, the something else press is not in a position to do very much pushing. But it's a book full of examples and anecdotes and exemplars of the clash between the eye and the ear world. On the blackboard behind is a phrase from Joyce which pin, pinpoints. Well, I'll read it out loud. It says, when European end meets end, I -N -D, which is a pun on the capital letter I, E-Y-E, so it's pronounced eind, when ear meets eye. No, he's saying the Western world, the whole European world, is going oral, just in the style that the Tony Schwartz tapes illustrate. As our new technology permits the sound of everything to be available and retrievable. The whole psyche of Western man alters. Now, when that psyche meets end or the East, I-N-D, <clears throat> he is saying by the time this happens, the East will have gone to the world of the I which means the world of separate selves. For many centuries, the East has lived in a tribal world of group self. No separate selves, whatever. Now they're going Western and they're getting visual separation of self. We are losing that. Don't ask if this is a good thing. It's like that prize fight you just heard. We do it. Nobody does it to anybody. We do it to ourselves. We are bringing this about unconsciously, I, I should imagine. And we are going oriental, our European end our ear open world is the end of visual, literate, Western 
man. Spengler was trying to say this back in the 20s, decline and fall of the West. He captured a lot of attention, but he didn't get very close to the reasons. But the Orient is going Western, and we're helping that along very much by warfare. Our wars have done more educating in human history. When I say our, I mean human wars have done most of the educating in human history. I wouldn't know where to begin. Certainly, uh, not, uh, certainly uh, Alexander the Great was a great educator of the Orient. He pushed Western ways into the Far East, changed their architecture, everything. Julius Caesar was a great educator as he <clears throat> crushed the Goths and the Huns. He taught them how to stand up and march in lines, straight lines, like civilized people. Civilized means visual. Napoleon has been mentioned before as a great educator. <clears throat> you read any history of Russia, and you'll find that one of the great contributing causes to the progress in Russia and the Russian Revolution was Napoleon's invasion of Russia. But war as educator is matched by education as warfare. in which you ruthlessly impose on other people a pattern of perception and feeling. Teach them how to behave. Teach them how to be neat and tidy. Teach them how to fit in. This is our own goal in education. However, I'm not saying this is wrong or right or wrong. It's a little too early to say that. Here's a book called The New Morality by a group of colleagues of mine up at St. Michael's College, Toronto. Print, printed by whom? Uh, Herder. Herder and Herder. Catholic Publishers in Milwaukee. Um, this is a book about this changeover in the church just like the de-Romanizing of the church done by the Fordham team, the taking off the hierarchy, the visual organization out of the Roman church, is what is called the ecumenical movement. Remove visual structure in favor of the other senses, participation, and you de-Romanize, you get liturgical reform and ecumenical love-in. This um, kind of world of change, to those experiencing it, is pure anarchy. To those undergoing change, life is hell. All the familiar patterns, all the security is gone. One could make out a pretty strong case against change. It encourages violence. Yeah, I just, uh, if, if you need a, a lamentable local footnote, uh, a, a book that we're really not pushing very hard is a, a history of Fordham that just came out by one of former uh, Fordham's former presidents, Fordham the first 125 years. And the, the last paragraph said, well, oh well, we tried for 125 years, but now sort of chaos and anarchy are on the street, but maybe we shouldn't worry about that because after all, Western civilization is going down the same hole in the bathtub and we might as well all go down together, you know. So it, it's, uh, it, it, it's there, you know, and in terms of the, the fears and engendered by the swiftness of change and all that business. But that's a, it, it's, a, it's a very scary paragraph because 
you, you, you get people now, and, and it's good to investigate it, I think, while it's happening, who have, who have literally spanned these two enormously different worlds. And it was somebody who was, who was around in the year 1910. The, the existence they lived at that time was so stable, so predictable, so regular, and everybody sort of knew the spot that they were in. It was a, a very simple world compared to now. And then you get the same people whose psyches were sort of programmed and who were educated to, to fit into that kind of world. And they get caught in the, the jet speeds and the computer age and the speed of change and the different styles of life and perception and things like that. And they don't have a clue. It's, it's a very scary thing when sometimes when they, you get a chance to, to look inside them and find out how really threatened they are by it. Uh, well, just what about that song we just heard? Nobody in the fight game or any other game has a clue as to who caused anything. Yeah. It would be very interesting uh, to take the Davy Moore thing, take it as a poem, take it as a Seeger record, take it with the sounds added, take a speech of some guy before the House of Representatives on the evils of professional boxing and do some testing on, on, on which one would, would change people's attitudes. I think... Right. Watch La Dolce Vita, 9 o'clock, Channel 9.